All right. We're going to be finishing off Ephesians chapter 1 this morning. Ephesians chapter 1. And I've titled today's message, Attaining True Wisdom from God. Attaining True Wisdom from God. It was J.C. Ryle, the first bishop of Liverpool, who was reported to have said, in his word, God reveals his will. And by prayer, we ask him to do it. Now in the first 14 verses of this chapter, Paul explained from eternity past to eternity future, God not only revealed his will, but also his whole plan of salvation when he formed the church. And in those verses also, he presented the wealth of spiritual blessings believers have been given through the work of selection of God the Father, the sacrifice of the Son, and the seal of the Holy Spirit. Well, in our passage today, the last part of Ephesians chapter 1, Paul will respond, will respond to what he just said with a prayer that his readers would comprehend the riches of their glorious inheritance in Christ. Now, verses 15 to 23 will consist of three parts. The first is an introductory thanksgiving and a reason for prayer. The second part is a report on the content of the prayer. And the third part will describe the greatest exhibition of divine power the world has ever known. So as we get into these words, as we get into these, these words that Paul wrote through the Holy Spirit, his great desire is that you would deepen your relationship with God, and that you would experience in a deeper way the spiritual benefits that you've been enriched with. So before we get into the Word of God, let's pray and ask Him to speak to, ask him to, speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray now that you will be with us as we continue to be with us as we open up your Word. Speak powerfully to each and every one of the people that are here, those that are watching and listening to this message. Everyone's going through different situations, different circumstances, some good, some bad. You only, and only you know, Lord, the joys and anguish, anguishes of their hearts. And I pray that you will speak to them personally now as we open up your word and read and that you also have a message for them in this, in this sermon, in this Bible study that you help me to prepare. Keep us safe here, Lord, and protect us from any harm. And Lord, we just look forward to what you have in store. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. The Word of God says, This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you, as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling? What is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And I'll stop there. In case that, in case you weren't with us when we covered verses three to fourteen the past couple weeks, 
There, in one long sentence, Paul explained to his Christian readers the vast wealth of spiritual blessing they've received, including election, predestination, adoption, grace, redemption, forgiveness, wisdom, understanding, knowledge of the mystery of His will, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, and inheritance. Well, here now, he states that upon hearing about the Ephesians' faith in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus, their vertical faith, and their love for all the saints, their horizontal relationship, he continuously, nonstop, thanks God for them and remembers them in his prayers. Now, I want to point out a couple of things about how verses 15 and 16, they tell us two ways spiritual progress is developed. How do you progress spiritually? How is spiritual progress developed? The first way is by having a vertical relationship with Christ. Vertical, you and Him. See, it was faith in the Lord Jesus that brought the miracle of salvation to the lives of these believers. And the personal pronoun, your, indicates that it's personal and active. It's a personal faith and it's an active faith. The second way that spiritual progress is developed is by horizontal relationship with other Christians other believers everywhere, not just here in the church, in this church, but all around the world. That church that is across on the other side of the city, on the other side of the state, on the other side of the country, it's around the world, developing a horizontal relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. See, a love for all the, state, all the saints, it demonstrates a transforming reality of a believer's conversion. But here's the thing. You can't have one without the other. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar, for the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So you see, by having a vertical relationship with God, it's going to lead to a horizontal relationship with other Christians. When those relationships are in tune with one another, like Paul, it's, it's going to be common. It's going to be very likely that you won't stop giving thanks for other believers, for your brothers and sisters in Christ, as you remember them in your prayers. Now, after this, in verses 17 through 19, he shares three specific, four specific ways that Paul prays for true believers. In verse 17, he prays for spiritual illumination. And there he says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Notice that he doesn't, he doesn't ask God to give them what they don't have but rather prays that God would reveal to them what they already have. But here he makes four requests, four specific requests in just these two uh, verses in this prayer. Before we look into those, there's two more facts I want you to realize or to understand. First, Enlightenment, illumination comes 
from the Holy Spirit. He is the spirit of wisdom and revelation. See, with a person, a human being's natural mind, an unregenerate mind, a mind that hasn't been enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they can't, they won't be able to understand the things of God. It's going to be impossible for them. As 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 16 says, But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit, because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it's uh, evaluated spiritually. A spirit, spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we, we have the mind of Christ. You get that? I mean, unless a person is born again, unless they've been enlightened by the Holy Spirit, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, they can read this book a million times and even memorize it, but they're not going to understand it. Once a person is born again and the Holy Spirit makes their home in, a, in the heart of a person, that's when, again, everything, the lights turn on and everything that's written in God's Word starts to really make sense. The Holy Spirit reveals truth to us from the Word and then gives us the wisdom to understand it and apply it. Not only that, but He also gives us the power, the enablement to practice the truth, to practice what it says. A second, second thing to note is that this enlightenment comes to the heart of the believer. We often think of the heart as the emotional part of a person. But the Bible, but in the Bible, the heart means the inner man, the inner person, and includes the emotions, the mind, and the will. The inner man, the heart, has spiritual faculties that parallel the physical senses. The inner man can see. As Psalm 119 says in John and John chapter 3, verse 3. The inner man can hear. As Matthew chapter 13, verse 9 says, and Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. The inner man can taste, Psalm 34, verse 8, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. The inner man can smell, Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, and 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. And the inner man can, can touch, Acts chapter 17, verse 27. This is what Jesus meant when he told the people, they seeing, uh, they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not. They're in Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. So here's what I'm saying. The inability to see and understand spiritual things is not the fault of the intelligence, but of the heart. The eyes of the heart must be opened by the Spirit of God. You're not going to get spiritual enlightenment by taking some acid trip, by smoking the ganja. No. True spiritual enlightenment, true spiritual wisdom comes from above. If you want to attain true wisdom, it comes from God alone. All right. So... Here are the four things that he prays for. Verse 17, that they might know God. This is the highest knowledge 
possible. This is the highest possible knowledge that you can attain to know God. The atheist claims there is no God for us to know. The agnostic states that there is a God, if there is a God, can't know him. But God, but Paul has met God in the person of Jesus Christ. And he knows that a man really cannot understand much of anything else without a knowledge of God. This willful ignorance of God led mankind into corruption and condemnation. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul describes the stages of man's de-evolution from willful ignorance of God, uh, of God to idolatry, substituting a lie for the truth, to immorality and indecency. So where does it begin? Where does it begin? It begins with an unwillingness to know God as a creator, sustainer, governor, savior, and judge. Every believer as a believer, they must grow in his knowledge of God. You see, to know God personally is salvation. To know him increasingly is sanctification. To know him perfectly is glorification. Since we're made in the image of God, the better we know God, the better we know ourselves and each other. It's not enough to know God as Savior. It's not enough, no. We must get to know Him as Father, Friend, Guide. And the better we know Him, guess what? The more satisfying our spiritual lives will be. Well, so far, we've seen the source of spiritual, that the source of spiritual illumination is God. The channel is the Holy Spirit, and the supreme subject is the full subject of God. So now he comes to the organs of enlightenment. The eyes of your hearts may be enlightened, he says there. This figurative expression teaches us that proper understanding a divine realities is not dependent on our having a keen intellect, but rather a tender heart. See, it's a matter of affections as well as of the mind. God's revelations are given to those who love him. So what does this do? This opens us up to a wonderful world of a wonderful possibilities for every one of you, for every true believer. You know why? Because even though we may, may not be the smartest people with the highest IQ, we can all have loving hearts. No, I don't know. I, I think this is true for everyone. I know it's true for myself. We all crave wisdom and revelation. We all want it more and more, right? As believers, we want wisdom and understanding. We want God to reveal more of himself to us. We long it. We desire it. Like we desire food. Each of us longs for instruction and insight in knowing how we should walk, what we should do, and where we should go. But again, notice what Paul tells us. It's profoundly simple and simply profound. Where he says that wisdom and revelation, you and I, so des the wisdom and revelation that you and I so desperately desire, is found solely in the knowledge of Him. 
Both Peter and John also found this to be true. The singular explanation for their ability to boldly and intelligently address the multitude was the acknowledgement that they had been with Jesus in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When people ask, what should I do? What is God's will in this situation? The answer is very simple, my friends. The wisdom you need, the revelation you seek, is found in knowing Jesus. And how do we know Jesus? By spending time in the Gospels. By spending time in reading His Word. Everything that we need to know, He's given us. Everything that we need to know in this life, in this world, right now, is given to us in the Gospels. In those red letters that He spoke. You may be working your way through Ezekiel or chewing on Romans Make sure, however, that you take time, that you take some time out of your day to take in something from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. See, I believe that the real key to understanding God's will for your life is to continually focus on Jesus. There's only one Isaiah, only one Hebrews. But there are four Gospels. Could it be? Could it be that in this, God is saying, I don't want you to miss this. Whatever, whatever else you're learning, the key to it all is my son. Man, I just got goosebumps thinking about that. key to it all is my son. Just as Jesus said on the, Emmaus, on the Emmaus road, all scripture points to him. So if you're spending time with him in the gospels, the rest of the word, the, the rest of the word become more clear. Holy Spirit makes his home in you and starts revealing these things to you. When you read the Gospels, you're like, oh, I get it. When I was an early Christian, young Christian, first I was hanging out with these young, also other young, zealous Christians, and I remember, <laughs> it was funny, um, the biggest, one of the biggest things we kept saying to one another is, it all makes sense. It all makes sense. Because we were just blown away. Everything started to make sense. You know, that stuck with me. Yes, I get it now. I understand. I wouldn't have. It was God who showed himself. He revealed himself. And I was like, oh, okay. I get it now why this is happening, why that's happening, and why that person's like that, and, you know, and why I'm being treated like this. Okay, it all makes sense. So, once the eyes of the heart are enlightened, The second thing Paul specifically prays for there in the beginning of verse 18 is that we might know God's calling. In the Christian vocabulary, the word called is an important word. The word church is a combination of two Greek words that mean called out. Paul never tried, never tired of satisfying testifying that God had called him by his grace and reminded Timothy that he, that uh, the believer has a holy calling. He never got tired of saying those things of 
saying that God had called him by his grace and that Timothy, that he told Timothy that all believers are, have a holy calling. We have been called out of, out of a, we've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says, and have been called to his glory, or called to glory. Let me re- repeat that. We have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light and have been called to glory. God calls us by his grace, not because of anything we've done, not because of any merit that you have accomplished or that you might possess. No, God calls us by grace and grace alone. Paul wants us to understand the hope that is ours because of this calling there. In, well, he will tell us there in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. Now, some callings offer no hope. But the calling we have in Christ, it assures us. It assures us of a delightful, wonderful, beautiful, and glorious future. Keep in mind that the word hope in the Bible does not mean hope so. Like a child hoping for a toy, for a phone, for a PS3. It's not that kind of hope. The word carries with it assurance for the future. See, the believer's hope is, of course, the return of Jesus Christ for his church. When we were lost, we were without hope. But in Jesus Christ, guess what? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that we have a living hope. A living hope that encourages us day by day by day by day. Dr. Kenneth Chafin, a well-known Baptist author, tells us about the pastor and deacon who were visiting prospective members and drove up to a beautiful suburban home surrounded by a velvet lawn and gorgeous landscaping. Two two expensive cars stood in the driveway. And through the picture window, the men saw their prospect lounging in an easy chair and watching his big screen TV. The deacon turned to his pastor and said, what kind of good news do we have for that guy? What kind of good news do we have for him? See, the point of that is how prone, how prone are we to confuse or, con- yeah, confuse prices and values? It can be very easy. Ephesus at that time was a wealthy city, a wealthy city. It boasted the temple of Diana one of the wonders of the ancient world. Today, Ephesus is an archaeologist's paradise, but all of its wealth and splendor are gone. But the Christians that once lived there in Ephesus, those Ephesian Christians, guess what? They're there. They're up in heaven right now. Today, they're in heaven enjoying the glory of God. The hope that belongs to our calling should be a dynamic force in our lives, encouraging us to be pure, obedient, and faithful. Pure, obedient, and faithful. See, the fact that one day we shall see Christ and be like Him, it ought to. It should motivate us 
to live like Christ today. The second half of verse 18, we see the third thing Paul prayed for. That we might know God's riches. This phrase here doesn't refer to our inheritance in Christ, as it said in verse 11, there in chapter 1. But His inheritance in us. This is an amazing truth. That God should look on us as part of His great wealth. He sees you as His treasure. Just as a man's wealth brings glory to his name, so God will get glory from the church because that's what's he, what he has invested in us. That's what he, he has invested in us. When Jesus Christ returns, we shall be, as verse 6 says, to the praise of of the glory of His grace. The praise of the glory of His grace. He tell you this, church. God deals with each and every one of us on the basis of our future, not our past. He said to cowardly Gideon, in Judges chapter 6, verse 2, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Jesus said to Andrew's brother, brother in John chapter 1, verse 42, Thou art Simon, and you shall be called Cephas, a stone. Gideon did become a mighty man of valor. And, and Simon did become Peter, a rock. We Christians, born-again believers, live in, the future, live in the future tense. Our lives are controlled by what we shall be when Christ returns. See, because we are God's inheritance, we, we live to please and glorify Him. This truth suggests to us that Christ will not enter into His promised glory until, until the church, all born-again believers, are there to share it with Him. He prayed for this before He died, and this prayer will be answered. Christ will be glorified in us and we will be glorified in Him. So knowing this should lead you, it should lead you into a life of dedication and devotion to the Lord. All right. Now in the last section that we're going to read there in chapter 1, we'll be seeing Paul's fourth prayer as well as a description of the greatest exhibition of divine power the world has ever known. So let's pick up where we left off. Ephesians chapter 1. Actually, I'm going to re... Um, yeah, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. Let me back up a little bit and start Start the sentence right. Verse 18. And then read the rest of the I'll read the rest of the passage. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the mighty working of his strength. Verse 20. He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. 
and he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Man, what a powerful word there. Oh, man. Paul's fourth, fourth prayer is that we believers might know, might know God's power. See, by making us his inheritance, God has shown his love. By promising us a wonderful future, he has encouraged our hope. Paul offered something to challenge our faith there in verse 19. The immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. So tremendous is this truth that Paul enlisted many different words from the Greek vocabulary to get his point across. Dunamis, power, as in dynamo and dynamite. Energia, working, as in energy. Kratos, mighty. Ischus, power. Ephesians chapter 1 can then be translated, uh, uh, verse 19 can be translated this way. What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the operation of the might of his strength. He, Paul, is talking about divine, dynamic, eternal energy available to us. After all, my friends... Our brothers and sisters in Christ, what good is it to have wealth if you're just too weak to use it? Or if you are afraid of, so afraid of robbers that you can't really enjoy it. John D. Rockefeller was the world's first billionaire. It's said that for many years he lived on crackers and milk because of stomach problems, because of stomach troubles caused by worrying about his wealth. More money, more problems, right? He rarely had a good night's sleep, and guards stood constantly at his door, wealthy but miserable. I've heard that The more money you have, the more you worry about keeping it. But here's the thing about Rockefeller. When he began to share his wealth with others in great philanthropic, philanthropic endeavors, his health improved considerably. And he lived to be an old man. We Christians need power for several reasons. To begin with, by nature, we're too weak to appreciate and appropriate this wealth and use it as we should. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41 says this, The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. To turn this vast vast spiritual wealth over to a mere human being, living by human wisdom and human strength, you know what it would be like? It would be like handing an atomic bomb to a two-year-old. See, God's power enables us to use God's wealth. But there's a second reason why we need God's power. There are enemies who want to rob us of our wealth. 
We can never defeat these spiritual foes on our own power. But we can through the Spirit's power. Paul here wants you to know the greatness of God's power so that you will not fail to use your wealth and so that the enemy will not deprive you of your wealth. This power that he's talking about here, it's seen in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, everything, the entire Christian faith, all of Christianity stands on this, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, people measured God's power by his creation or by his miracle at Exodus, at the exodus of Israel from Egypt. But today... In the, in the age we live in right now, we measure God's power by the miracle of Christ's resurrection. Much more was involved than merely raising him from the dead. For Christ also ascended to heaven and sat down in the place of authority at the right hand of God. Understand that you see that? He's not only Savior, but He's also sovereign. Jesus isn't only Savior, but He's also sovereign. What does that mean? No authority or power, human or in the spirit world, is greater than Jesus Christ, the exalted Son of God. Amen? Isn't that great? No one at all, past, present, or future, will ever be greater than Jesus. He is far above all, and no future enemy can overcome him. Why? Because he has been exalted far above all powers. You may be asking, how does this apply to me today? How does this apply to me today? In verses 22 to 20 and 23, Paul there explains the practical application. Because we are believers, we are in the church, which is Christ's body, and he is the head. This means that There is a living connection. There's a living connection between you and Christ. Physically speaking, the head controls the body and keeps the body functioning properly. Injure certain parts of the brain and you handicap or paralyze corresponding parts of the body. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, Christ is our spiritual head. Through the Spirit, we are united to Him as the members of His body. This means that we share His resurrection, ascension, and exaltation. When we get to chapter 2, verse 6, Paul will tell us that we too are seated in the heavenlies and all things under our feet. No wonder, no wonder Paul wants us to know the exceeding greatness of his power toward us. See, apart from his power, we cannot draw on, uh, we cannot draw on our great wealth in Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit 
through the resurrected, ascended Christ is available to all Christians by faith. His power is toward us who believe. It is grace that supplies the wealth, but it is faith that lays hold of the wealth. We're saved by grace through faith, and we live by grace. We live by grace through faith. Let me repeat that once again. We are saved by grace through faith, as it says there in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. And we live by grace through faith. It says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. In the four Gospels, we see God's power at work in the ministry of Jesus Christ. But in the work in the book of Acts, we see that same power at work in ordinary men and women, members of the body of Christ. What a transformation took place in Peter's life between the end of the Gospels and the beginning of Acts. What an amazing transformation there. But what made the difference? What made the difference? The resurrected power of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. The greatest power shortage today isn't our generators or our gas tanks. It's in our personal lives. Warren Wiersbe tells of the late wealthy newspaper publisher, William Randolph Hearst. He spent a fortune collecting art treasures from around the world. One day he found a description of some valuable items that he felt he must own. So he sent his agent abroad to search for them. After months of searching, the agent reported that he finally had found the treasures. They were already in Mr. Hearst's warehouse. Hearst had been searching for treasures that he already owned. If you're a Christian, if you're a born-again believer today, right now, God's mighty power is already yours. But perhaps, like Mr. Hurst, you aren't aware of what you possess. I'll ask you, are you, are you experiencing God's mighty power to overcome temptation and to live a holy life? Are you experiencing that power? You can. You, you must. As a believer, you need to hold on. That power is yours. It's already available to you. You just have to receive it, take it by faith. Ask the Holy Spirit to reign wild in your heart, to start removing those things that shouldn't be there. This life, He created for you to love, to enjoy. Do you look around and see the beauty of this world? To see the beauty in people, to see what could be the possibilities so now I ask another question. Having gone through these prayers, these, these things that he prayed for, for believers, will Paul's prayer, prayer be answered in your life? Will you, starting today, begin to know by experiencing God, God's calling, God's riches, 
and God's power. If that's what you'd like to receive today, that, those riches, that forgiveness, that love, I don't want to invite you to the cross. I want to, but, but let me tell you this, that you need to come to an understanding that you're a sinner. If you can't admit, readily admit and confess that you're a sinner, that's pride that's still in your heart. You must, again, admit that you're a sinner and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. So if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to claim and hold on to that forgiveness and those riches that God is really, really ready to give to you, all you've got to do is just ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. So, again, if you've never prayed before and you want to be forgiven of your sins, I want to lead you in a prayer to do that and to become born again. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and with all your heart, with all sincerity, again, open, soften your heart Pray this. Lord Jesus, I know, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I'll turn from my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Savior. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me. Fill my entire heart with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me and strengthen me with this power that we talked about today in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you truly pray that with all sincerity, God has just handed you treasure, vast spiritual treasures. Let us know that you prayed that prayer. We would like to hear about that. If you need help in your next steps of your Christian walk, we want to maybe help you with that as well. God has an amazing plan for you. And he has, he's going to do some amazing and great things in your life. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the cross. Hold on to him. He'll give you that power, that strength that you need. Remember, you can't do it on your own. You've tried and it didn't work. Holy Spirit will give you that power now. I hope you have a great week. Thank you for joining us. Again, all I ask is that you share this message if it blessed you. Let us know how we can bless you by reaching out to us. And I look forward to, to continuing on here in Ephesians chapter 2 next week with you all. Have a great week. I love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. 
Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.